Secretary of State, as you know, it's a very turbulent time in the world. We've got Syria, we've got Ukraine, we've got the migrant crisis. So why the oceans? Why are you devoting so much energy to that? Because uh, the oceans are a security threat, challenge. The state of the oceans are a security challenge for everybody in the world. They are under siege by overfishing, which is a food challenge to people in the world and an ecosystem breakdown challenge. Uh, they are polluted in many, many places. There are more than 500 dead zones in the ocean now, which will affect spawning grounds and the future of the ecosystem. The oceans are rising due to climate change and acidifying because of climate change. CO2 goes into the water and it, uh, metasta it changes uh, form, becomes carbonic acid, has a profound impact on sea life. So the oceans are threatened. We get 50% of the oxygen that we breathe on this planet from the oceans. And we should not play with them. We need to be respectful. We need to do things to turn the course around uh, because life itself is threatened. And that's why we're taking time to do this. This is a life or death issue in the ways that other challenges are also life and death. I mean, that really is the question of whether we can do anything about it. Of course I mean, you can do I mean, I mean take it. fishing. I mean, there are lots of parts of the world. The Mediterranean is one example, uh, close to the United Kingdom in Europe, where it's pretty much fished out. Can you get well, the fish Well, that's the back? problem. The answer is yes, you can bring it back, but you can't fish for a while in order to do that. We had that problem in Massachusetts a number of years ago. We lost our striped bass uh, stock. And so we banned striped bass fishing for 10 years. Today, there is a healthy uh, stock of striped bass. People can go out, recreational fishers, commercial fishermen, but it's done in a sustainable way. And the reason the Mediterranean is where it is, it wasn't done sustainably. So that's exactly what we're trying to foster here, is a sustainable approach, a sustainable ethic where you can fish, yeah. but you're doing it in a way where it's allowed to replenish and be there for the future. But you've got the problem of enforcement as well, haven't you? You have a huge problem with enforcement, and we will be announcing here a safe ocean network that is going to put in place modern technology to begin to do the tracking of fishing efforts in various parts of the world. And as we build that out, and we hope to do it rapidly, we will gain better control over who's fishing where and w what they're fishing. Quite a strong British sell. contribution to that, I believe. Likewise, it's, yes, it's indeed, a, a great British contribution. Satellite from that. Didcot. And but we're also, uh, you know, we have the port state measures. When I started this conference in 2014, only 20, 10 countries had signed up to this protocol, a treaty, where you would actually have restrictions on people's ability to sell fish within a port and they'd have to be able to prove where they caught it and that they were licensed and that it was appropriate. Uh, and and uh, uh, now there are 60 nations signed up for this measure and it only took 25 to make it become international law. So we're building this out. We're trying to do that in the context of this uh, uh, this conference yeah. and we'll, we'll continue. Let's take plastics for a moment. I mean, massive amount of plastic in the ocean, which ends up in digestive systems and elsewhere. Some action on microbeads on both sides of the Atlantic, but here we are, four single-use plastic bottles here in, in the State Department. I mean, it, can you win that battle against plastics? Yes, but it takes responsible approach to it. It takes, uh, uh, I mean, we've done a lot, as you know, with respect to uh, recycling of bottles. Uh, there are a lot of products made now with recycled fish nets and recycled plastic and uh, even clothing is made in some ways with some recycled plastic as part of it. So there are a lot of things that we can do if we change the way people think and, and, and their casual practices. You can't just throw it away on the beach. You can't just, I mean, people, there have to be consequences for actions. Now, what we haven't talked about yet is the whole question of global warming acidification, which perhaps is the climate change, the biggest threat. You, you've done what you could in uh, Paris, yet we've got uh, Donald Trump saying he would cancel uh, that uh, initiative and questioning the whole question of, of a global warming. I mean, what would be the impact on the sort of things you're trying to do if we ended up with a Trump administration? Well, I'm not permitted to engage in the politics, so I can't start taking sides one way or the other. Um, but it's no secret that I believe very, very strongly in the science of climate change. And I believe uh, today we have a President of the United States, Barack Obama, 
who has implemented major policies in order to respond to the, to the urgency of climate change. He has changed automobile standards, truck standards, building standards, power plant emitting standards, put in place major initiative on climate change and so forth, a climate action plan for the country. Uh, so I want that to continue in the future and I hope uh, the American people will vote in a way that uh, mm -hmm. reflects the urgency of these issues. Because presumably your efforts here are hampered by the fact that the United States is not a signatory to the Convention on the Law of the Sea? No, well I mean occasionally I run into uh, a, a sort of comment or two about why aren't you in it, but we the reason we're not in it is we have a United States Senate that won't ratify it. Exactly. But the administration and the last administration before it, which was Republican, made it clear they would live by the law of the sea. So George W. Bush, his administration has lived by it. The Obama administration has lived by it. And I hope the next administration, even if we can't ratify it, will continue to live by it. A lot of talk about the pressures, pressures on the Secretary of State at the moment. or. or on Hillary Clinton, who was Secretary of State, uh, do you think she's physically up to the job, got the stamina? I, I am absolutely convinced she is, but it's not my job to get into this race. So let's not be asking about the candidates, okay? We got to, uh, I have no doubt about her physical stamina. She's strong, you know, mm. but, I, but let's, you know, let's talk about the fish and the, and the... Yeah. What about Britain's role in all this? Because there's a perception that perhaps now that Britain's voted for Brexit, doesn't that carry the clout, the influence that it has in the world? I noticed that it's, well, a, we're gonna have, I mean, Britain it's a junior minister that that here today. Change. Britain insists that that won't change. Um, what do you think? I, 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 we have to see what evolves. I mean, it's too early to tell. We were against Brexit. Everybody knows the United States of America thought it was a mistake. Uh, but now that it's been voted on and passed, the will of the people is gonna be implemented and respect it, and we will respect it and try to find a way forward that uh, meets the security needs and the trade needs, the economic needs uh, of uh, our relationships, and that's our, that's our job. But that role is being a bridge between Europe and America, presumably. Well, maybe gone. some of that, and maybe some bridging, but uh, we also have to work out our own relationship uh, uh, with uh, whatever changes take place in Europe as a result of this, or whatever change there is in the relationship between Britain and Europe. We don't know that yet. And we need to give them the space to uh, negotiate and work through the Brexit process. David Cameron, as you know, has quit politics this week. Uh, what do you think the verdict will be on his international role, bearing in mind I, I, the president, for example, saying he uh, lost concentration in Libya? Um, I, I, again, am not going to get into the business of commenting on, uh, you know, the former prime minister or prime minister of another country, or that's not my job. Mm. Uh, my job is to build the bridges, not tear them down. And Yeah, you know. but it is a mess in Libya, isn't it, and it's affecting... Well, Libya people. is getting, yes, it's been a mess, uh, and President Obama himself has publicly stated that he wishes that he and others had focused more on the aftermath of Libya. Uh, and we've been working extremely hard to bring the Libyan government to a place of legitimacy. Uh, we've made a lot of progress. We need to deal now still with some outlier players who are not yet unified into the government of national unity. But I think we're making progress. We will have meetings on that in New York next week, and I hope we can strengthen Libya. Two quick questions. Syria, Britain, America wanted Assad to go. It seems if there is a settlement now, he'll stay. Uh, I have no knowledge of a, quote, settlement or a deal. Uh, I certainly, we have But any deal, deal, a deal you're working towards would let him stay? Uh, no, uh, this is something the Syrian people are going to have to decide and something the negotiations are going to have to decide. Our position is still that we don't see how you can possibly make peace or how there will be peace in Syria with Assad still there because I think he is a magnet who draws the jihadis, who attracts the, uh, the uh, conflict such as it is today. It's defined around Assad to a certain degree. 
And I don't see how he makes up for barrel bombing his citizens, torturing his citizens, gassing his citizens. Uh, I just don't see how that happens. But it's up to the Syrian people mm -hmm. to decide uh, what will be the future of Syria. And that will happen, we hope, when they get to the negotiating table in Geneva. Finally, a reflective question. You ran for president. You've ended up Secretary of State after a long career in the Senate. Do you think, actually, you can influence the world more as US Secretary of State than as president? No, I think that the president of the United States is obviously the most powerful position uh, in our country, certainly, and one of the most powerful in the world, if not the. Uh, so obviously what I do as a Secretary of State, I do with a president who wants to yeah. do those things and who licenses me to go out and do those things. Uh, so this is not automatically, inherently, a powerful position. It has been powerful, I think, in the last years because the president has trusted me, he has empowered me, and he himself has adopted a set of priorities uh, which uh, put us in sync and have empowered us to be able to, uh, I think, be effective in Afghanistan and uh, in our policy in Ukraine, trying to get the implementation of Minsk and getting the Iran agreement and getting the chemical weapons out of Syria and working now on Libya, on Yemen, and helping to bring about a Paris Agreement, uh, the rebalance to Asia, the TPP. I think we've been able to, you know, the, the, the uh, Ebola crisis and uh, now the Zika. We've been able to be effective because we have a president who is engaged on a global basis. Thank you very much. Thank you.